When you serve on a jury, you are serving in an institution that is older than the United States of America. It is older than democracy itself. By participating in this function, you are part of that long line of jurors who for centuries before have played this absolutely critical role of sitting in judgment of their peers and delivering an honest and just verdict. The jury that we have was really created in medieval England. So it's been over 800 years of being an essential part of English common law. So in colonial America, juries would have looked similar in some ways today in the sense that they were 12 people. They would have all been men. They would have been, for the most part, middle-class people. Typically, a criminal trial lasted maybe 10 to 15 minutes. And to make sure that they resolved it quickly, the jurors were ordered uh, to, be, to have no uh, meat, drink, fire, or candle because nobody ate until they were all unanimous. Increasingly, juries are a kind of check on the lawyer class and on the judges. They're really intended to keep the judges honest, to prevent bribes, uh, to make sure that the judicial system is transparent. The British Parliament in 1774 passes a series of laws known as the Intolerable Acts. These acts, in part, limited the power of juries and restricted what juries could do and who could serve on juries. That was really one of the sparks that led to the American Revolution to establish a right to jury trials. In the U.S. Constitution, we have Article Three, which guarantees a right of jury trial in criminal cases. It's one of the few rights that is actually in our Constitution, not in the Bill of Rights, which is added uh, later. Then the Bill of Rights confirms it in the Sixth Amendment guaranteeing juries in criminal cases, Seventh Amendment guaranteeing juries in some civil cases. John Adams famously said that the right to representative government and to a jury trial were the heart and lungs of liberty. One of the problems was that this did not apply to African Americans who were enslaved. The Supreme Court in the Dred Scott case in 1857 decided that not just enslaved African Americans, but any African American who was descended from slaves was not and could not be a citizen of the United States. The Civil War really could be seen as a struggle to overturn the court's decision in Dred Scott. Because they were not citizens, they couldn't serve on juries. They couldn't testify either. They couldn't be parties in cases before the court. After the Civil War and after emancipation, people who had been enslaved were now potentially eligible for jury service. And this was a huge thing in terms of expanding participation uh, in our jury system. You can imagine mass massive resistance um, in many of the former Confederate states to this type of jury service. And so various techniques were used to try to exclude African-Americans from jury service. For many, many years, the jurors were all white and had to own land. In the late 1800s, the Supreme Court said a West Virginia statute saying jurors had to be all white was unconstitutional. The Supreme Court's decision in the Strouder case was an important advancement in the right of African Americans to serve on juries. Strouder was an African American who was convicted of murder by the courts in West Virginia by a jury that was made up entirely of white people. Strouder challenged this, and the case went up before the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court held that you could not be excluded from a jury on the basis of your race, and so therefore explicitly racist jury policies were unconstitutional, but um, many places found techniques that they could use um, to nonetheless uh, restrict jury service. If we look at our democracy, the right to vote and the right to serve on a jury are really the two important cornerstones of it. And we also see how they're connected to each other. For many years, people were chosen from voting lists as to whether or not they'd be eligible to be serve on a jury. And so if in the voting list, we excluded people on the basis of race, either directly in our early years or indirectly in the form of poll tax or literacy tests, that meant we really were also excluding people on the basis of race from serving on our juries. We look at the Jim Crow laws that really put up more obstacles and hurdles in terms of separating races and not allowing them to serve in certain parts of our democracy. One of the big improvements came with the Voting Rights Act of 1965, because in many jurisdictions, how you become a juror is to be on the voting rolls. 
Open your polling places to all your people. Allow men and women to register and vote whatever the color of their skin. By expanding the voter rolls, uh, it then expanded the pool of people who are eligible uh, for jury service, and it eliminated uh, one of the techniques that had kept so many juries uh, as an all-white institution. So the first territory to allow women to serve as jurors was Wyoming in 1870. It was a frontier territory. It had very few women. It wanted to attract women, and one of the ways it could do that uh, was by offering up voting and uh, jury service. And then it took essentially 100 years um, for the rest of the United States to come on board. Initially, the Equal Protection Clause was really seen as applying to men and not to women. It really isn't until the 20th century uh, that we have a series of decisions by the Supreme Court in which the Equal Protection Clause is applied to gender as well as to race. In other words, what I'm saying is I think women are every bit as entitled to the protection of the 14th Amendment. They are persons. Those cases struck down bans on women from serving as jurors and allowed women to participate in jury pools. Sex like race is a visible, immutable characteristic bearing no necessary relationship to ability. Even if women had a formal right to serve on the jury, sometimes it didn't in practice work out that way. And in many cases, uh, the attorney simply used peremptory strikes um, to eliminate women from uh, the jury pool. And these are the strikes that an attorney can use to simply excuse a juror. They don't have to give a reason. They don't have to explain it to the judge. They simply say, uh, we would like this juror not to be part of the jury. So it's really not until the, probably the 1960s and 1970s that we get juries and jury pools that consistently reflect um, you know, the gender diversity of our country. The courts have often stepped in to examine the way in which lawyers use their peremptory challenges, the way in which they may be excusing jurors, not for cause, but on the basis of whatever reason they choose. And in 1965, a case went to the Supreme Court called Swain versus Alabama. And in that case, an African-American man was charged with rape of a white woman in Alabama. The prosecutor had used his peremptory challenges to strike all of the African-American jurors or potential jurors from sitting on that jury, leaving it with an all-white jury to decide the case. The defense argued this is unconstitutional. It's a violation of equal protection. Any state prosecutor who uses his peremptory challenges to affect this result, the exclusion of a whole racial group, violates the Equal Protection Clause. The Supreme Court found that there was nothing impermissible about the way the lawyer used his challenges. It only took the courts here in California about 10 years to correct that injustice. And in 1978, in a case called Wheeler versus California, the California Supreme Court looked and examined the issue of a prosecutor who used these peremptory challenges to strike all the African-American potential jurors from the jury pool, leaving an all-white jury to try and decide the case. The California Supreme Court found that that was impermissible and unconstitutional under California law. The California legislature has acted in a couple of very dramatic and important ways to help our juries be more diverse. So in 2019, a bill was passed by the California legislature that gave persons who have previously been convicted of felonies, not all of them, but many and most of them, the right to vote and the right to serve on juries. In 2020, the California legislature passed two very important bills that deal with racial justice, and criminal justice in the state of California. The first bill dealt directly with jury selection that prohibited the use of peremptory challenges on the basis of a broad array of issues, not just on the basis of race, but on the basis of gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, ethnicity, uh, nationality. I'm also grateful for the fact that we're also addressing the issue too, this time of jury selection. So we're talking about really addressing the issues of justice and fairness in this country. Also in 2020, the legislature passed what's called the Racial Justice Act. And the goal of the Racial Justice Act is not only to make the system and the outcomes more fair, but to make it more inclusive. 
Serving on a jury is one of the most important things that a member of a community can do. It not only ensures us that the outcome will be fair, but it helps give confidence in the outcome to people in our community who look at what happens in the courts. Also, historically, the jurors can serve as a barrier and as a safety provision for people who are charged with crimes and criminal cases. It's really the jurors who sit between the state in the form of a prosecutor and a person accused by the state in the form of the defendant to be able to make sure the government acted fairly, acted properly, and acted without improper motive. And finally, it is the jury that really brings that little piece of compassion, sometimes mercy, into the courtroom we can see why it's so important not just to have a jury, but to have a jury that's made up of people from all parts of our community so that they all bring their perspective, their life experiences, their understanding into the courtroom. And it's through that shared knowledge and that shared exchange that we hope we can have some outcome that's fair. That is how our system will work better and will help us move towards a more perfect justice system.